Hello guys, like, this is our second interview in the series of interview with uh, LIGO India and its scientists in the wake of upcoming O4 run. So today we have got Professor KG Arun from Chennai Mathematical Institute and I am Avigyan from 137 Inverse, the physics club of Aizar Berhampur. I am the core committee member and I have also got uh, my colleagues Shubhakti Paul and Avijit from 137 Inverse. They are also the core committee members. So they will conduct this interview over to them. Professor Arun, as you currently work at the Chennai Mathematical Institute and are one of the India's leading researchers in gravitational wave astronomy, please share with us the insights of your fascinating, fascinating journey and what has sparked your interest in this area. Yeah, thank you so much for the you know for contacting me and conducting this interview. Yeah, so it is. So I started to work in this area starting from my PhD days. So I did my PhD at the Raman Research Institute, working with Professor Bala Iyer, and that is the first time I got exposed to gravitational waves. And that during my PhD, I was mostly working on uh, what is called a theoretical modeling or source modeling of uh, compact binaries. So these are binaries consisting of black holes or neutron stars, and which we have seen several of them over the past observing that. So the idea would be to uh, calculate the waveforms that these uh, these signals and how the signals look like. Uh, so that's what I did for most of my, you know, during my PSP times. And that was my first exposure. And uh, uh, then since then, I think I did my, during my postdoc, I also got involved into some of the data analysis related issues, especially with the transient uh, gravitational waves, burst, what is called a burst. And I continue to work on the theoretical aspects uh, then. And then I did, my second postdoc also, I continued to work on theoretical modeling and how we could use them to, uh, you know, to carry out tests of general theory of relativity. Then I joined the CMI in 2010, and since then, uh, and a few years after, I've been involved again with the LIGO scientific collaboration. And I've been, you know, I've been part of the discoveries and the various interesting things which followed uh, since then. That's my quick uh, recap of what my timeline. So, uh, your uh, PhD was in modeling uh, compact binaries. How precisely do you do this? Like in terms of physics, how does it contribute to the understanding of the fundamental laws of nature, particularly Einstein's laws? That, that yeah. check. Yeah. So I think uh, the, the important point about the source modeling is that it is a very crucial ingredient for data analysis. So uh, we make the best use of uh, the fact that uh, our existing knowledge or the prior knowledge about the signals immensely help in the data analysis of the signal. So that is why we need uh, the theoretical modeling. Now, in terms of the physics, you can imagine that we are looking into two black holes and neutron star orbiting around each other. And the in spiral, as they lose energy due to gravitational waves, is described by some theory of gravity. That means there is an interaction, gravitational interaction between them, which is what is driving uh, this in spiral, and eventually they, you know, which they merge. Now, the, the physics is really that, you know, this, this could be neutron stars or black holes, which has got mass and spin and so on. So you need to have a, a complete description of the gravitational dynamics of these two objects, accounting for all the physical effects such as uh, mass, spin, etc. So that is what we essentially do. But the important thing to keep in mind is that if you, for the same binary system, the masses, let's say M1 and M2, uh, the signal or the dynamics will be different in a different theory of gravity because the, uh, the gravitational interaction between them is different in a, in a different theory other than GR. So that is where uh, it is also linked to our ability to test GR because if the signal we have observed is not consistent with what is expected of GR, then you know that is something evidence uh, for the fact that uh, there is a probable violation of GR. So that is why the, uh, the waveform modeling or the source modeling comes at the interface of um, both data analysis as well as fundamental physics because it can also be used to test whether GR is indeed the correct theory of gravity or how much, how close does the data or the signal match with the predictions of general theory of relativity. So that's the quick one. The testing of general relativity and other gravitational theory is another focus of your research. So how precisely is this accomplished and how would you describe this to an undergraduate student measuring in physics like students like us? Yeah, so I think, as I, uh, as I mentioned, what we are really testing is that the gravitational interaction between these two objects which are inspiring, whether that is indeed as, a fall, I mean, as, uh, you know, whether it's in obeys general theory of relativity, or there is some beyond Einstein or beyond GR effect. That's what we are really testing, right? If we had an alternative to GR, so just like GR, how we are doing waveform modeling and so on, 
if we had very accurate waveforms in a different theory of gravity, it is simple because we could use that waveform and compare with the data and ask the question whether the signal in the data is it more consistent with GR or with the other theory of gravity, whatever the other theory is. But unfortunately, we are not in a situation where we have a very accurate waveform that could be used for data analysis in the other theory of gravity or any other theory of gravity. So what we do instead is that we ask the question whether, so we can introduce, so there are expectations about what kind of physics would be leading to violations of GR. So what we do is that we look around GR, so we introduce free parameters or deformation parameters. So we are deforming GR and ask for whether these deformation parameters, which are like, you know, uh, extra parameters, which is not in GR, but will be there in other periods of gravity. But that these three parameters should be taking zero because we are deforming about zero. It's like a, you know, we are just slightly disturbing uh, uh, GR. So the deformation parameters are, uh, should take value zero in GR, but in a different theory, it will be non-zero. So what we ask is that we, by introducing these so-called deformation parameters, we ask whether, uh, you know, these deformation parameters are indeed consistent with zero, which is GR or not. So in that way, even without knowing uh, the details of the other theory of gravity, we are still able to test GR by using our best understanding of the dynamics, uh, you know, the dynamics in GR. So that is, we make the best use of our GR understanding and ask whether there is any deviation from GR. So that is the approach we take in all these, you know, most of the LIGO works uh, that we do, and it has been largely successful, we can put. So it can happen that some of the so-called deformation parameters may have, you know, there will be other theories of gravity which we predict them to be uh, of some finite value. So we can translate this, this limit, so these bounds we get from the data to those theory, and we can ask how well that theory is bounded, uh, for example. So this is the approach we take without relying on details of other theories of gravity, we test around GR and we test GR is correct or not. That's a question we ask instead of uh, asking a more general and uh, more general question of whether you know, something else is true or not. And of course, once we detect some uh, violation of GR, we have to think about what that violation means and how we can understand them and so on. But that is that will be a level two question after, uh, uh, after identifying or after having seen some very confident uh, signatures of uh, violation of GR. So Einstein's general relativity plays a major role in your uh, research. Yes. So, so the connection between short gamma ray bursts and gravitational waves is another uh, current research interest of yours. So how can LIGO or maybe LIGO India in the future uh, be of a long-term assistance in this regard? And will O4 run be able to be any of any assistance to you or your research? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, uh, the gamma ray burst is an electromagnetic phenomena. We are seeing ejected emissions from a, uh, from some, you know, uh, of some source. We don't know what that is. But astrophysics uh, people have conjectured already that, you know, the short version, one class of this gamma ray burst could be coming from mergers of neutron stars or neutron star and black hole, you know, wherever neutron star is involved. And this was, of course, confirmed by our dextro binary neutron star uh, signal in uh, 2017. We saw a gravitational wave and a gamma ray burst together, and we now know that at least one class of these mergers does happen. So that is where it is coming from. Now, the question that we want to ask is that, so we, of course, we knew this gamma ray burst for a long time, decades, for example. But why gravitational wave is important is because of the following. So this gamma ray burst is the emission, whatever that is coming up, it is coming much, um, no, much farther away from the source. So we are not able to probe uh, the physics close to the source. So if it is due to the merger of two, uh, you know, two ne neutron stars, there is some remnant form and the remnant is doing something to give out the jet. But what exactly this object is doing uh, to give a jet, which happens much later, we cannot probe that regime uh, because electromagnetic uh, emission happens much later and much farther from the source. So that is where we need to, uh, you know, if we have gravitational waves, because we are seeing the three phases, the, you know, the early in spiral, then they come closer, they merge, and then there is a new remnant that is giving you probably the jet, right? So this is what gravitational waves uh, can tell you, that the jet, the details of the jet, and how the jet is related to the central engine. Central engine is something which is launching this jet, which should be a remnant of the merger. And what kind of jet is it launching? Is it, uh, the, what is the geometry of the jet? For example, uh, the, we can see a jet only when it is launched towards you because a very narrow jet, like a conical jet. So if you are viewing it off axis, that means you are not viewing exactly along the axis of the cone, you may see different structures and so on. So geometry of the jet 
and the structure of the jet. For example, we do not know how does different layers of the jet composed of and what is the details of that. So these are things which are related to central engine, which the uh, electromagnetic observations alone cannot completely probe. So what gravitational waves will enable you is to combine the information from gravitational waves and the electromagnetic observation, and together they should give you a more complete picture about what is the central engine and what is the source that we are seeing, what is the structure of the jet, and what is the geometry of the jet, and so on. So that is why it is very important to combine. You know that's why the relevance of combining um, electromagnetic and uh, gravitational waves, and that's called multi messenger because electromagnetic wave is one messenger, and gravitational wave is another messenger. So it is important to combine. You get a more coherent and more synergistic you know a combination of the thing. So that's one thing. Now coming back to LIGO, what is important to identify a gamma ray burst in association with the binary neutron star merger is that we should be able to localize uh, these mergers, whatever is happening, to very good accuracy. Only then one can point electromagnetic you know, optical telescope or uh, gamma ray telescope and so on to that patch of the sky to detect a gamma ray burst. Right? So this, uh, usually our existing network of detectors are uh, not very good in source localizing. It may have hundreds of square degrees error bar in the sky. It's very huge. So one cannot uh, expect uh, electromagnetic telescope to follow up such a huge patch of the sky. However, once you have a global network, including LIGO India, for example, which is very well separated from LIGO and Virgo on, the, on other continents, we expect that our ability to localize these sources should dramatically improve, which should mean that our ability to follow up on gravitational wave mergers to look for gamma ray should also dramatically improve. And that is why, you know, LIGO India, once it realizes, should significantly impact our multi-messenger uh, astrophysics that uh, LIGO and Virgo and LIGO India can do together. So that is where the LIGO India aspects come, because we have a geographically separated detector, which is like a larger baseline, and hence we have a significantly uh, improved uh, uh, source localization, which in turn helps all the physics I mentioned uh, in the beginning. So that's where the LIGO India would play a very important role in the gamma ray. So now, please provide more details about how you help the LSC. You participated in the discoveries made during the earlier LIGO dance, which produced some outstanding findings. So could you briefly describe your involvement in the prior observing runs like O3? Yeah, so I think, uh, not just O3. So I think, as I told you, I was, uh, I mean, I'm involved in the LSC from 2012, whenever you know, the Indigo, the Indian group of uh, LIGO LSC was formed, uh, we have been contributing and of course we happen to be also part of the first discovery which which won the Nobel Prize in 2017 and so on. So but my contribution has been mostly on the test of GR side, so basically fundamental physics uh, uh, using gravitational waves and uh, to the detection and the following thing, we contributed to different analysis which allowed us to test GR by various means. So I told you about the generally how it is done. But specifically, we can do it in various, various methods, uh, you know, because we want confidence and we want to try various aspects, various predictions of GR. We want to test them to see whether that is indeed holding true in the data. So I was involved in developing, for example, a test of propagation of gravitational waves. So this is when you have gravitational waves according to GR will propagate non-dispersively. That means there is no dispersion. Different frequency components of the wave will travel with the same speed. So one one can use, ask the data, uh, uh, use the data and ask the question whether there is any evidence for non-dispersive propagation of gravitational waves. And if we see some evidence, it will mean that GR is not, uh, uh, is not the true theory of gravity. So I was involved in the developing a, a method with a former ICER Kolkata student, Anuradha Samajdar. So we contributed uh, with other collaborators, of course, a method which is now part of uh, the usual LIGO, uh, uh, I mean, all the test of GR that LIGO does which is to constrain possible dispersion of gravitational waves. So that is one of the things which is now kept, we keep, uh, keep doing it in all the future observing runs. The other thing which I was involved in is uh, with a former student of mine, Krishnendu. Uh, so we, um, we developed a method to test whether these mergers that are happening. So we, you know, what are binary black holes? Uh, so there is also scope for uh, black hole mimickers. So these are, these are objects, compact objects, which are not quite black holes. They, you know, they, are, they mimic or they fake the properties of black hole and hence it is very difficult to distinguish them from black hole. This kind of candidate objects can exist uh, from theoretically. Uh, so we wanted to ask the question that how we can um, use gravitational observations to constrain whether these are indeed mergers of binary black holes or some of these exotic alternatives to black holes. So we developed a method which uses spin-induced multiple moment, this technical thing, don't worry about it. We use spin effect as a way of gauging 
whether this object which are merging are indeed black holes and black holes or not. So this was developed by, you know, uh, we developed it, we contributed to LSE and this is again now part of the standard uh, standard type of test we do. So this is another thing that uh, I was involved in. You know, on top of it, we have been uh, contributing to different uh, small things uh, like analysis reviews and so on. But uh, now specific to O3, I also happen to be uh, the, you know, so usually the LIGO scientific collaboration will form an editorial team which is uh, in charge of writing the paper, uh, you know, this collaboration paper. So I happen to be the chair of the editorial team which led the uh, test of GR paper, you know, the, uh, the paper which reported several types of tests of GR uh, using the O3B, the previous, uh, previous observing run. So I, uh, so that means I will, uh, I, uh, I mean, I help to write the paper, coordinate different analysis, make sure things are, you know, things are all fine and so on. So that was uh, something which I uh, contributed towards uh, the O3B as well as the O3B. And in the, I mean, as I mentioned, all the analysis which I mentioned are now applied regularly on all the, on all the observing grants and also the future one. Now, right now, I am also working with the PhD student of mine, Science Ritata. Uh, to improve uh, the efficiency of some of the tests that is done, so that you know, we can we want to use uh, methods such as uh, you know uh, data-driven methods such as uh, singular value decomposition and so on to optimize the existing tests of GR. So we are uh, developing some of these things, uh, uh, gearing up uh, for O4 for in mind, and hopefully we can add that layer, additional layer, and optimize some of the things uh, to do a more rigorous and robust test of GR. So that a rough uh, idea about what I will go through. So basically, uh, the O3 run was uh, extremely successful. Uh, yeah. So what exactly do you expect from the O4 run in general? Not in yeah. your field, but in general. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, the it is what is impressive about O3 is that O3 has seen very diverse kind of sources. So for example, now we have seen a binary black hole. We have seen several binary black hole mergers. At least one binary neutron, at least two binary neutron star mergers. And at least one uh, neutron star black hole merger. This completes all the compact binary thing. And also, if you look into the uh, details of binary black holes, we have seen things with very asymmetric systems, very mass ratio, you know, M1 by M2, mass ratio of close to 10. We have seen very high mass uh, merger, almost like intermediate mass black hole, like 150 solar mass. We have also seen a uh, highly processing system that is, you know, spins of the black holes are not aligned. With respect to the orbital angular momentum, it can do a larger kind of precision. So we have seen them. So we have seen many, many. Uh, I mean, already we have seen many diverse types of binary black holes apart from binary neutron star and neutron star black hole. So I would expect that this, you know, this diversity is going to again increase because we are going to see hundreds of them uh, during O4. So we would uh, be seeing much more diverse and many surprises because we need to. You know, we, we didn't know about the existence of many of these things until we detected them. So I'm sure we are going to be thrown, you know, we'll be having many surprise, surprise discoveries in O4. So if you ask about my wish list, I think I would say that, you know, one binary with, uh, with an orbital eccentricity. So what we have seen so far are mostly binaries which are you know, close to the merger. They are in circular orbit because it's, they move on circular orbit. So it can happen that some of the formation channels, so some of the ways in which blind black holes may form, it may lead you uh, to you know some eccentricity by the time they merge or very close to the time we observe them. So it is going to be a very interesting thing because it can tell you something about the formation channel. So definitely a binary with eccentricity will be something which I, you know which I would like to see. And uh, other thing is of course that you know we saw one binary neutron star merger with uh, uh, with the electromagnetic counterpart uh, in the 1717. Uh, but we are not seeing any neutron star black hole mergers with a with a short GRB counterpart. So it would be great if we detect uh, one uh, neutron star black hole merger with a, uh, with, a, with a GRB. And also, maybe Ajit already talked about it in this thing. So lens uh, binary black holes. So these are like uh, black hole, uh, binary black holes, and two copies of the same merger coming at some, I mean, with some this kind of delay. It will be another exciting thing because it is going to tell us about uh, structures uh, that is there in the intervening phase between the source and us. So these three, that is eccentric binary and, uh, you know, uh, multi-messenger neutron star black hole merger and the lens, uh, lens BBHS would be my three wish list, you know, three of the top wish list for me. For all. India is also constructing the LIGO detector, which is built as a fantastic initiative for fundamental research. So what impact do you think it will have on the GW astronomy discipline and how will it help to raise awareness of fundamental physics? 
Yeah, so I think you know, the important thing about LIGO India, once it's realized, it's a very complex instrument. We know that LIGO is a very uh, complex instrument. So once we install LIGO India and run LIGO India, we would have demonstrated that we can you know, we can build and uh, manage and run this com complex instrument, which of course a big inspiration for all those you know, who wants to work in experimental gravity and uh, gravitational waves and so on. So that's of course is going to be a great uh, thing for us to achieve. I already mentioned about the uh, implications uh, for it for, in the case of GRBs and so on. Now, the, in terms of community, uh, so one would expect by the time LIGO India is realized, we would have a much wider community which works on theoretical aspects, data analysis aspects, and experimental aspects. So it would mean that, and also, of course, you know, the addition waves is a really new field of astronomy. It is yet to give you many, many surprising uh, elements of the universe. And so we are going to discuss many, many interesting and exciting discoveries in the coming years. So it's a very interesting area that younger people would like to get on to in any of these aspects, as they told you, theory, data analysis, or experiment. But with the LIGO India being realized and uh, be building a community which spans across uh, these disciplines and spread over India, I think it is going to be extremely important that, you know, if a younger student want to get into the thing, I'm sure he or she will find uh, enough, you know, enough people to interact initially and uh, do, uh, do a internship, for example, and get trained and uh, contribute to this effort. Because this is going to be, you know, we are just at the beginning of a new era in astronomy and there is a lot uh, for it to see. So I'm sure that in terms of uh, the people getting into, uh, it is going to be very important. Of course, that will also mean that as a community, uh, the senior people and student PhD students working in this field, they should all be on watch out and you know make people aware of the excitement about this new field and what you know, what to expect in the coming years and why it is exciting and so on. So I think overall, you know, LIGO India and the community that LIGO India will develop along with its installation and running and so on is going to impact uh, you know the Indian astronomy and the Indian physics community in a very big way. I mean, I would think that's my take on. Uh, yeah, so just a question, uh, just my curiosity. Uh, you were talked about, uh, while talking about gamma ray bursts, you said that we cannot detect the gamma ray bursts that are uh, away from it, I mean, uh, that are directed away from us. So actually, we cannot detect it, or there are some methods to detect it. <clears throat> No, so I think what so what happened? Uh, you know, the this, uh, gamma ray burst. We can detect them. I'm talking about electromagnetically because electromagnetically. We can, so this is a very narrow uh, beam of uh, like a jet, and the jet opening angle is like you know uh, it may be 10 degrees or two, you know, uh, something like that. So we can detect them only if it is pointed towards us. So we will miss a lot of GRBs which are pointed away from us. But then the number of such events in the universe is so high that the subset of them will always be pointing towards us. So we will be missing any anyway uh, using electromagnetic telescopes, and but we will see still a pool of DRBs. But if you look into gravitational waves, because gravitational waves are not, you know, it's not pointed uh, detectors, so gravitational waves wouldn't care whether they're pointing towards us or not. That is why the second binary neutron star detection, you know, the one which happened in 2019, we did not see any electromagnetic counterpart. Uh, but we did, you know, it, it may be that it also gave you a jet, but that jet was away from us or was fainted from us. So, but uh, gravitational waves will not, it's not so sensitive to this beaming aspect, but electromagnetic telescopes are sensitive to it and it can see only if it is, if you lie within the cone or slightly away from the cone and so on. So, it, we will be missing many of them, but then the number is so high that, you know, uh, we will still see a subset of them in any case, even if they are pointed away from us. So, basically, this gravitational wave detection acts as a fail safe, even if we don't measure the electromagnetic thing. We can yeah. we can measure the gravitational wave from exactly. So I think we can see when a neutron star merger happened or a neutron star black hole merger happened. But you know, uh, but whether it produced a gamma ray burst or not, we cannot tell. I mean, I have no idea. But definitely, the mergers we are seeing, regardless of whether there's a GRB accompanying or not. Okay, so uh, that's all that we had. Basically, so thank you for answering all our questions patiently and uh, helping us get more information about this and making us more interested in this field. Yeah, thank you so much. So I think it is great. And thank you so much for your time in you know, uh, placing these questions and so on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, uh, yeah, thank you, sir.